How's it going guys? It's me, the Dom Fanatic, and welcome back to a video, yes, a video on this YouTube channel. It's been quite some time, um, sort of ever since uh, Ultra Sun, Ultra Moon kind of like died out naturally with the progression onto Sword and Shield. Videos weren't really like a thing on my mind, neither was competitive Pokemon too much to be honest. Um, the, like the, the fun of it had kind of faded. But we're not here to dwell on that, we are here today to, well, basically, this is a guide on how to breed um, competitive Pokemon to take part in uh, competitive Pokemon singles, uh, it could be doubles, could be in the online tournaments that Pokemon, uh, sorry, Game Freak and Nintendo will be running on the game, or it could also be for something like Draft League, or you just want to show off and, and flex some cool Pokemon, which I'm going to do to you shortly. So, the aim of this guide is to basically cover as many if not all bases um, that need to be covered when it comes to breeding uh, a, a competitive Pokemon. So this could end up being a fairly lengthy video. Uh, I'm going to try and split it into segments and I'll try and remember to put timestamps in the description of the different segments should you need them. So in this guide I'm planning to cover the following. The nurseries in the game, where they are, how you use them, what you need to do. Um, items that you need for breeding, how to get them, and the reason you need them. Um, I am here to cover IVs and natures, and how to get good IV Pokemon, and how to get natures, um, a sort of how you want. There's a lot of personalization you can do in this game. Um, there is egg groups and ditto, specifically ditto. Uh, and then I've got a miscellaneous uh, sort of section at the end, which with parts that aren't necessarily super important. Um, for breeding competitive mons, but are quite nice extra bonuses. So, um, I've kind of tried to do this in a chronological order of the process of breeding. Um, I realised I'm connected to the internet and I'm now going to have to miss this Centre Scorch raid, which is really upsetting me, um, but never mind. Um, I figured we'd start by sort of talking where the nurseries are in the game. So, I am currently in the wild area. Uh, I will show you the town map as to where I am in the wild area. It is in the area between the two large sort of bridge areas, um, between route, uh, no, the Motorstoke outskirts on the east, and route 5 and uh, Hullbury. So you can see where my smiley face is. Uh, it's also next to where the, uh, the two digging brothers are. They are just over there past the tree, but they're not currently spawned in. Um, you have got a nursery here. Now, I've tried to think this through multiple times uh, in my head, and I can't quite figure out a use for this nursery. Obviously, if you guys want to breed eggs at double the rate, then that's absolutely fine, but that's about it. You can only carry five eggs at once anyway, because obviously your team is of six, and you can only uh, you must have a Pokemon that is sort of alive, I guess, and not an egg, um, in case you encounter wild Pokemon or get into a train of battle, which you shouldn't do, because I think there's only one train of battle that can really kind of get in the way of sort of the recommended breeding process. So, I wanted to start here to let you know that this is here. So, um, we're going to fly over to the other nursery, which is the one you guys probably will have come across uh, before this one here uh, in the wild area, which is up here in Route 5. So, you have got Turfield for reference, and then as soon as you leave Turfield, you go east, go on to Route 5, and you have got the nursery. I would recommend flying directly to the nursery as it takes you outside the front door, which is just more convenient than having to go to Turfield or Route 5 and then just moving along. So, um, this is a much better nursery, um, I'll tell you that now. Um, I currently have, I believe, a Ditto and a Treepy in the daycare here. Um, so there's some bits I can't necessarily show you. Um, but the idea of the nursery is, it's a bit different to the daycare centres in previous Pokemon games. Your Pokemon do not gain EXP while in the nursery, it is purely here for creating eggs. So. I guess for helping fill up your Pokedex by catching evolutions and then hatching some eggs of lower stage evolutions in the family, uh, or breeding competitive Pokemon, which is what the idea is here. So, um, the reason why I believe this sort of nursery is best, there's two reasons. One is the wild area has frame rate issues, it can get frustrating, can slow down the process. No need to do that. Um, the other reason is you've got a rather nice long route here, you've got this massive bridge, um, which you can go all the way along or you can just sort of go part of the way and turn around um, Another good thing about this is you can find like feathers on the floor which help boost uh, EVs 
on Pokemon later on, which you can use. Um, there is a little bit of grass there, and these guys here are trainers. Um, but as long as you battle them before you start breeding, then you should be good to go. There shouldn't be any disturbances. So that's why I prefer this um, nursery for breeding Pokemon. So the pricing structure is a bit different as well. Now uh, your Pokemon don't gain experience from actually being left in the nursery slash daycare. This is because in the old games, your pricing was based on how many levels your Pokemon had grown. So if your Pokemon had grown 10 levels, I believe you would get charged 1100 uh, currency because you get, it costs you 100 anyway, and then it costs 100 more per level you gain. Because there is no gaining of levels in the nursery this time around, the Pokemon, it costs 500, I'll, I'm going to say pounds because I'm English, 500 pounds to leave one Pokemon there or 1000 for two. Um, pretty self-explanatory basically um the general basics of um breeding are you put a male and a female of the same egg group in the daycare all with a ditto and it makes eggs that's that's pretty much it but we'll go into more details a bit later on so the lady here uh you need to talk to her you don't actually ever need to go into the nursery which is fantastic the nursery lady teaches you a bit more about breeding but i'm covering that all here pretty much anyway so the lady will be standing there with her arms down normally when you go and talk to her um, when you want to go leave stuff, uh, when you want to go leave your Pokemon with her, um, the lady will cross her arms and think like this if she's holding an egg. So I'm going to talk to her. Um, she's going to tell me there's an egg, and I'm going to take it. Uh, I believe this is a Dreepy egg. Like I said, I've got a Dreepy and a Ditto in there because I was trying to get a uh, shiny Dreepy. Um, so when you get this screen, because my party is empty, it's gone straight into my party, but like in Sun and Moon, if you have a full party and you pick up an egg, you can put it in your PC or you can swap out, um, a Pokemon for the egg. Um, that's pretty much the basics of the nursery itself. It's a real simple system. Um, I think my recording has just frozen, so I will be right back. Okay, so I went to record the next part of my, uh, of the walkthrough. And I realised that I forgot to change the sound settings, so uh, I'll, I'll go over what I missed out uh, in a second, but I thought I'd just start here for a bit of change of scenery. So, uh, I've got a list of four, I say four, four items that you will want for breeding. Two are a necessity, two are kind of optional. So, the first place where I am, I should show you quickly, is I am in the hotel in Chichester. Um, if you want to get here, basically you want to go east from the Pokemon Center a little bit till you're in the little circle with the water fountain and it's the big building on the left. This is like a hotel, you'll know as soon as you come in. You walk up to the lift here at the back and you'll get to where I am at the moment. What you want to do is you want to walk over to this building over here uh, and you want to go to the back here and talk to this policeman officer. Now I'm not going to talk to him because I believe you can rebattle this person over and over again. But basically, it's Morimoto's in-game character. Uh, so once you've beaten the Elite Four, you can battle Morimoto. Uh, and if you beat him, he does give you the Oval Charm. And what the Oval Charm does, well, I will cover that shortly. Um, so that's the one of the optional items. I would definitely recommend it because it does help you produce eggs at a much faster rate. Um, especially considering the sort of space I showed you get outside the nursery where you can move around. Um, the next stop is going to be the Pokemon Center in Hammerlock. Now, forgive me for one of these items, because I know I picked up the item. I want to say I picked it up in the wild area, but I haven't double-checked um, that part, simply because I forgot to, so we'll go over it now. Now, these two items, like I said, one is, I believe, available in the wild area, um, but if not, both, or all of these items are locked behind the end game. That's because you need battle points to buy them. So if I go and talk to this lady here in the Pokemon Center, we can see we have the power items and the destiny knot. Power items are the other optional item you can use for breeding. Um, they're not crucial, nowhere near as much as the destiny knot. If you're not going to use the destiny knot, then you're leaving your chances of getting good IVs uh, a lot more to luck. And it's very unlikely that you'll be able to breed competitive Pokemon unless you put in a serious grind. This item makes it so much easier. Um, more so than the power items, but I'll go over them again shortly uh, in a moment. The last location of oh, uh, the last item you'll want to get, and arguably what like the most important, um, is actually over in Turfield. Um, so if you fly to Turfield Pokemon Center, we're going to be obtaining an Everstone. Now I do remember this one, although I have already picked it up. Uh, if you are a bit silly, like I have been in the past, and you make your Pokemon hold the Everstone and then you release it while it's holding the Everstone. 
don't worry, you can get more Everstones. Um, if you haven't picked up one up already here, you can come to this area. By this rock here where I'm standing will be like a yellow sparkle. That's your Everstone. If you do manage to lose it or trade it away or release it, something like that, then you can go and obtain one from Rog and Roller uh, in the, I believe it's this this mine area, in the sort of south of Turfield. Um, if you just want to get like a Butterfree with Compound Eyes, I believe that increases the chance of held items. And then if you want to... I don't know, thief or covet it with something else, then that'll be a quick way for you to get an Everstone. So they're the items that you will need. So actually, we're rather handily quite close to the uh, the daycare. So let me get... Oh, she's got another egg for me. Tell you what, you can keep this one. So I'm going to take back uh, my Pokemon. I'm going to take back my Dreepy, because my Dreepy at the moment is currently holding uh, an Everstone. So the reason why my Dreepy, uh, so actually, if you haven't guessed already, I'm now gonna talk into why the items are used in breeding. So the Everstone is used to um, actually let the Pokemon that's in the egg inherit the nature of the Pokemon holding the Everstone. So for example, um, you can see here my Dragapult uh, is a jolly nature, and that is highlighted by the fact it's got red on speed and blue on special attack. So red means increase, blue means decrease. We'll go over that in a bit more detail later on. Um, so that was a jolly nature. Now, that was holding an Everstone when it was being used um, in the daycare, and thus a Pokemon was hatched from the egg with a jolly nature, highlighted in red and blue. So that is why an Everstone is very important when breeding competitive Pokemon, because natures are very important. Again, I'll go over that in a bit later on. Um, the next item, which I believe I have in my bag, is the Destiny Knot. Now, the Destiny Knot's use for breeding isn't highlighted, I don't believe um in the actually i'll tell you what i'll do it by name because then at least i can go to d in here do i have it in here or do i have it something okay i don't have it in my bag i must have something in the pc with it on um but the destiny not basically means that your pokemon that is going to be in an egg inherits five ivs from both sets of parents so the idea is you want pokemon with good ivs in the daycare so for example if you have a pokemon that is six ivs uh sorry two pokemon holdings that are six ivs so max 31 ivs in each stat then um if you're holding a destiny knot you're going to inherit five of those stats from some one parent or another so you're guaranteed to get a five iv pokemon but those ivs aren't necessarily going to be the ones you want it is potluck so basically what you want is you want parents with more IVs, which stands for individual values. I do go into those in a bit more detail shortly as well. Um, where was I? Yes, if you so if you have two six IV mons that guarantees you a five IV baby, however the IVs may not be the ones you want. Um, it is important that you want an, uh, IVs that correspond to the nature's boons and buffs. But again, go into that in a bit later on. So that's why the Destiny Knot is incredible. It helps you inherit IVs. If you don't have Destiny Knot on there, I don't know what the IV inheritance sort of feature is. But I think the IVs of the baby are completely random if you're not holding a Destiny Knot. Which is why it will take you forever to try and breed a Pokemon that has pretty much perfect stats for competitive without the Destiny Knot. So the Everstone and Destiny Knot are vital for that reason. Um, next up, you do get the Oval Charm, which is actually in the key... Um, the key items pocket because you don't actually have to do anything with it it says what it said it does pretty much there on the screen it's a noble charm that increases the chance of pokemon eggs being found at the nursery it just means that you find more eggs and because egg hatching is really quick in this game it's really handy um the last set of items uh which i already spoke about were the power items um so you've got the power bracer where are they i've got them in here somewhere lmnop nope i'm Okay, I, I, I do have one of them. Um, have I just missed it? I have the power weight. So you have the different power um, items. You've got the bracer, belt, lens, band, anklet, and weight. And they all correspond to one stat point. So for example, um, the bracer... Yes, the power bracer is related to um, attack EV gaining. So in held item... Uh, to help Pokemon it reduces speed but allows the holder's max HP to grow more so if you battled a Pokemon that gives out one HP EV it would then increase it I'm not sure if it doubles it or what it does um, but it's useful for EV training um, once you've got a good Pokemon that you want that you've hatched um, but the trick for breeding is for example if you have an, a four IV Pokemon and it's missing a, an IV you really need 
You can't use it in conjunction with the Destiny Knot. I do not believe, anyway, because I've tried that and it didn't bring the results I wanted. But say you had a Pokemon which you needed to get with a max HP IV, which it doesn't have yet. You can then give one of the parents a power weight, and if that parent has the max IV, your baby will inherit that max IV confirmed. So you can't use the Destiny Knot to then inherit five more IVs. I believe what it does, I mean, again, I don't know if this is proven or not, but this is what I've kind of figured out, is it inherits four random IVs from the five remaining. So if I, for again, if I had a Pokemon with a max IV in HP and I gave it this power weight, the baby would inherit for 100% chance of inheriting that IV stat. Again, it also works if it's zero, zero IVs, so zero speed. Uh, is very useful for Trick Room, and Zero Attack is very useful for minimising the amount of recoil damage you take from Confusion. Um, so from like Swagger strategies and, you know, Flatter strategies and things like that. So I hope that makes sense. I will leave something in the description regarding the items, sort of locations, and their use. Um, if I've gone over this too quickly, I apologise. If you have any questions over the use of the items, then leave me uh, some questions uh, in the comments. But that's pretty much all the items you need. Once you have those, then you're pretty much set to start breeding. Um, what you'll need next is to basically have an understanding of IVs, natures, and how to obtain the IV rating system. So, I've already briefly explained, an IV stands for individual values, so if I go to uh, the PC and I show you my Dragapult uh, here, you'll see that it says best in HP attack, defense, special defense, and speed. So, I don't know what each phrase means, because if you go to Colossal, for example, you've got decent, very good, pretty good. Um, there is other ones. Oh, okay, so I hatched a perfect IV drapey. That's quite nice, to be honest. Um... There's different phrases for different levels of IVs. Now, IVs, you don't need to worry about specific IVs anymore because hidden power isn't a move in the game. But we won't talk about that because you don't need to know about it. Um, IVs range from 0 to 31, and the idea is if you want a perfect mon, you only need five perfect IVs in the relevant stats. Um, so, for example, I have a Dragapult here, which is a Jolly Nature, highlighted by the fact speed is written in red, and Special Attack is written in blue. So blues indicates this is a stat with a bane, so it loses 10% of its maximum uh, number. Um, and if it's in red, it means it's a boon and it has an extra 10% um, sort of stat, I guess. So for example, if this was just a neutral speed nature, it would be slower than if it was jolly at level 100 because it has the extra 10% of stats, whereas special attack is 10% lower than if it was neutral in special attack. I hope that makes sense. Um, so I only need perfect IVs and HP attack, defense, special defense, and speed because this Pokemon isn't designed to be special attacker, it's designed to be physical, therefore I do not need to care about special attack. You can go for all perfect IVs if you want, but like I said, you can only inherit five, so it's completely random if you then get a sixth best in that list there. The only reason you probably really would want six bests is if you had a nature which lowered defense or special defense which sometimes you do run on mixed attackers um you want to get basically hit as hard as you can and the idea is they're only there to late game sweep or kind of like switch in and out frequently so it, their defenses don't really matter but it's always good to be able to take as many hits as possible um but again that comes down to luck so that's IVs. Basically, you want to aim for IVs that are useful to your Pokemon. So obviously in this case, HP, Defense, and Special Defense help my Dragapult live as long as possible. Having max attack lets me hit as hard as possible, and let me having max speed lets me outspeed as many things as possible. So what you can see here where it says best, uh, pretty good, and all that on the right side, you don't get at the start of the game. You only get that once you've got to, uh, I think it's round four, or stage four of the Battle Tower. So you have to beat... Um, two trainers then you have to beat another two trainers then you have to beat another two trainers then on the fourth time you enter or the third time one of those two you have to fight leon in the trainer tower and once you've beaten him you unlock the ability to check ivs of the pokemon so this is pretty much what you guys will see when you're in a pc just like a, 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 a sort of the, the model of the pokemon and if you press the plus button if you press the plus button it does bring up their stats here and their dynamax level their ability held item and all that sort of stuff um, but then once you have the IV checker, if you press plus again, it comes up bringing up this list here. So it's really good to get that if you want to breed. 
Um, like I said and touched on previously, the ones that you want to look out for are best. Best means 31 IVs in that stat. No good means zero. And like I said, zero is useful in speed if you want to run a trick room team. Um, and in attack if you don't want to hurt yourself as much in confusion as you would normally. So, that's IVs. Now, natures I've kind of touched on again. Uh, I've mentioned the boons and banes. That's basically created by the nature of the Pokemon. So, for example, in this case, my Dragapult is Jolly. Jolly nature increases the speed um, stat of your Pokemon and it decreases the special attack, which is perfect for this thing because it's really fast, as you can see, and it hits on the physical side, so it's perfect. And like I said, it means I can get 10% more of my stats in speed and it means I get 10% less of my stats in special attack. Um, it's important to note there are no natures that increase the HP, of a Pokemon, they are all, um, uh, HP is the only stat that can't be affected. Every other stat can be affected by nature. And you can also get some natures which do not affect stats at all. You kind of don't get a bonus in one stat and a boon in, uh, sorry, a bane in another stat. Um, the important thing is if you are, I would, this is why I recommend using an Everstone because it's cheaper and easier. Um, if you do breed a Pokemon with perfect stats but it has the wrong nature, then you can buy mints um, with battle points and you also do earn some while progressing through the uh, the uh, battle tower in the post game so if i go to my uh thing here i gotta find one so a lonely mint if i was to use this mint on a pokemon it would change its ability to lonely so this is new to generation 8 and this is really useful but it's a really expensive way of doing it and i wouldn't recommend on relying on it however what i would say they are useful for is if you do get a shiny pokemon for example um, in the wild with some good stats that you would like to modify with bottle caps and um, mints, for example. Um, what mints are also going to be useful for is giving Ditto a specific nature, which I'll touch on later on. So I think that's just about everything I can cover on IVs and natures. So you kind of want to understand what nature and what IV you don't care for on a Pokemon before you pick on, you know, what you want to do with them in the daycare. Like I did with Dragapult. I know it's fast, I know it hits on the physical side, Jolly makes perfect sense. I don't need special attack, so I didn't bother breeding for a max special attack Dragapult. So that's IVs and natures. So the next part I've got here is um, IVs continued. Because, like I showed you, um, my Dragapult has all good IVs. Um, to get them good IVs, the parents need to have good IVs. Now... The best way that I have found in this game, and it's the best of any generation I've ever had to breed in, is that Pokemon from raid battles are guaranteed, especially the five star ones, with the purple aura or Gigantamax forms. They tend to have at least a certain few um, sort of perfect IVs as such. So if I go and use my, actually I'll tell you what I did do. I got incredibly lucky the other day and I managed to get a Center Scorch which had an adamant nature and it had perfect stats for everything um, and it's its Gigantamax form. I, I, I literally creamed myself when I got this. Um, but this was a raid boss and I didn't have to do anything with this. I haven't touched it. Um, like I said, it comes with all these IVs. It is a female, so if I now bred something with good IVs, I could hatch more Sizzlepeds, or whatever they're called, um, with perfect stats. Um, I did, I believe, use... Uh, what else did I use? To, to start off build, breeding these Dreepies, I did use... Oh, what's it called? The, the snake thing. The ground snake thing. I can't find it now. Where is it? I've probably gone past it a million times, and you've probably all... Oh, there it is. Um, so I got this Sandaconda which you can see has got best in five stats. Again, it's a Gigantamax form. And if I find a Butterfree, is this the... No, that's not the right Butterfree. Is it this Butterfree? Uh, no, I think this Butterfree I got in a three-star raid. So as you can see, it's got less perfect IVs, but it still has a workable amount. Um, so I would recommend getting raid bosses um, as parents and breeding them onto other Pokemon. Uh, I'll talk about egg groups and stuff later on. If you're incredibly lucky, you can get 5 IV Dittos from these Max Raid Battles, which I would highly suggest if you do come across a Ditto Raid in the uh, wild area, you go and do it as a priority if you're going to be want to be breeding. So, that's IVs and Natures covered. Um, the next thing I have sort of 
like noted down here so if you do hear me flicking paper it's literally because i have written things down to remind myself is egg groups and ditto so we spoke about ditto the beautiful thing about ditto is that it's ditto it can transform into any pokemon and it lives up to that expectation in terms of breeding as well so ditto can breed with pretty much anything and ditto is also necessary when it comes to breeding certain pokemon which are genderless or set to one gender so for example clink uh, is genderless but you can breed it with ditto uh, for example rufflet can only be male obviously if you haven't got a female one you can't produce a baby but with ditto you can and the same with mandibuzz and um Vullaby. they can only be female so they obviously haven't got a male counterpart although you could breed them with another sort of bird pokemon as such so ditto is really good in pretty much breed of everything i think the only pokemon you can't breed in this game are the legendaries and the fossil pokemon don't know why the fossil pokemon can't be bred but that's what i heard i haven't actually tested it yet um so ditto is really important um when you breed with ditto you always receive an egg of the Pokemon that you are breeding with the Ditto. So if I put Ditto and Score Bunny in the daycare, I would get a baby Score Bunny every time. You can do the Destiny Knot trick and the Everstone trick with Ditto the same as you can any other Pokemon. Um, so Ditto is basically the ultimate breeding machine. And if you are lucky to get a 5 IV Ditto, then your time will be so much easier because you don't need to worry about what I'm going to be talking about next. Um, which is egg groups. So if you're not lucky enough, like me, to have a good Ditto... Um, but you might have got something really good in a raid battle like I did where I got my really good Sandaconda. So I took my Sandaconda and I took my Ditto and I took my Dreepy. I bred my Dreepy until I got a female Dreepy. And then I bred my female Dreepy with this Sandaconda until I got IVs in attack, defense, special defense and speed. Then what I did was found another dragon or sorry something in the dragon group which could breed on uh, the max HP stat, which eventually I did get. So, if you haven't got a Ditto to breed, you need to consider egg groups. So, what I have written down here is, and I'll link you Cerebi. If you have, don't use Cerebi, I would highly recommend it. Um, but each Pokemon belongs to either one or two egg groups. Um, so my example I have here is Grookey, uh, is part of the grass group and the field group. Field is literally the majority of the things uh, in the Pokedex. The, also, breeding partners kind of make logical sense at times. Obviously, yes, we had the famous Skitty and Waylord, but rest in peace, Skitty, you didn't make it into the game. Um, scenario where Waylord and Skitty can breed because they're in the same egg group. Um, but I've got here that Grookey, as an example, is field and grass. So in that case, Grookey can only breed with other Pokemon in the uh, grass or field group. doesn't have to be both. So, for example, Grookey can breed with Seedot because Seedot is part of the grass egg group. However, Grookey can't breed with Magikarp because Magikarp belongs either to the Water 2 or the Dragon Egg group. Again, it kind of takes, you know, it's kind of logical that Grookey can breed with another grass type. However, it's also very logical that Grookey can't breed with a fish. Um, but I think Magikarp could breed with things like Dratini, which kind of makes sense because Dratini would live in the water. But again, Dratini's not in the game. Rest in peace, Dratini. Um, so that's egg groups. I would highly recommend, like I said, you check a website like Cerebi. So if you want to pick on a Pokemon you specifically want to breed, like I did with Dreepy, I then found out Dreepy belongs to the Amorphous group. I believe it's the Amorphous group. It's like the group of all ghosts and stuff. Um, and the Dragon group. So I had to pick something which could breed in the Dragon group. And as I said, Sandaconda is part of the Dragon group. So therefore they were compatible and could make eggs together. So that's egg groups and ditto. Um, that's pretty much the majority of what you need to know for breeding uh, competitive Pokemon. I've got other bits here written down which you guys might um, want to know more about. So miscellaneous parts. You may have realised that I have Colossal up front in my party. It's incredibly useful, not important, but I would say you're very stupid if you don't do it, is when you're hatching your Pokemon, eggs you want to have a pokemon that has either the flame body ability or the magma armor ability and the reason this is is because it halves the amount of steps required to hatch eggs so it speeds up that process a whole lot more so this combined with the able charm literally lets you pump out eggs and hatching eggs twice as fast as it would without them 
So it's really important that you do this. I would recommend getting a Colossal yourself, mainly because it's accessible before the first gym. And I believe you could just use a Roly Coly if you aren't far into the game, because uh, I believe that has Flame Body as well. I know Sizzlepeed and Center Scorch get Flame Body as well through um, the raids as its hidden ability. And I think things like Turtonate might get Magmarama as well or Flame Body. Again, just get something with either of those abilities. I don't know what they are, but I would just recommend Roly Coly or its evolutions because that's what I found and it, it's worked for me absolutely fine. So absolutely get a Pokemon with Flame Body or Magma Armor in the first slot. They can be fainted if they uh, if you want, but that wouldn't make sense uh, to do that. And they have to be first. If I switch this and my, um, what's it called, Dragapult around, the effect wouldn't work. So make sure it's first in your party. Next up is what people call the Masuda method. So if I go and talk to the lady here at the daycare, uh, I'd like to take back my ditto I have here. And I was very lucky to be offered a French ditto. Now, because I'm playing on the English variation of the game, um, oh wait, my ditto was holding this destiny not the whole time, who knew? Um, because this is a, I'm playing on the English game, I would need a ditto from somewhere with uh, basically foreign to the UK and it can't be the US or anywhere like Australia that has English as like a native language It would need to be somewhere like France, Germany, Spain, Italy, Japan, Korea, China sort of foreign language games and The reason you want you need or you might want to consider using a foreign Pokemon is when you breed a foreign Pokemon with uh, Sort of Pokemon from your own region and um, you do get massively increased shiny odds which is why foreign dittos are very sort of in demand if you can get a foreign ditto with decent ivs you're going to have a very good chance of breeding shiny pokemon with good ivs which is always a good start they're always worth a lot of sort of trade value and they're always really nice to show off in your competitive battles so although it's not necessarily sort of related to competitive um pokemon breeding you can just also use one of these just if you want to try and get a shiny starter for example because they're shiny locked um, I believe with Masuda, the odds are about 1 in 500. It could be 1 in 1500. I don't know if I misheard it. And again, if you have the shiny charm, then I believe your odds drop even lower to about 1 in 400 or 1 in 1400. Again, I can't remember what it was off the top of my head. But again, it's better than the 1 in 4000 you have from normal hatching or catching. Um, next up is egg moves. So I don't actually think that I have anything with egg moves. So there's two ways of getting egg moves. One is from catching Pokemon with the yellow aura around them, uh, or catching raid bosses, because um, they have chances of having egg moves. But obviously we're here to talk about breeding, and the best way of doing that is um, having the parents knowing a specific move that the Pokemon can't learn by level up. So an example I have here is Score Bunny and Hitmonlee are in the same egg group. I can't remember what egg group it is. But Hitmonlee learns High Jump Kick via Level Up, and Score Bunny can learn High Jump Kick through breeding. So if you breed a Score Bunny, a female Score Bunny, with a male Hitmonlee that knows High Jump Kick, the baby will learn High Jump Kick. And in this game, when one parent has that egg move, the baby after that is always going to get that egg move. There were sort of different ways of doing it in the past, which was a lot more faff, um, but this way round is much better. Um, I believe in the past it used to have to be the male that had the moves, but I don't know if that's a thing in this game or not. Um, which is why the high jump kick and the Hitmonlee and Score Bunny example is pretty solid example. Uh, again, I would recommend you use Cerebi because if you pick a Pokemon you are trying to breed, if you scroll down the page of that Pokemon, it does tell you what Pokemon... Um, uh, sorry, it does tell you what egg moves that Pokemon can learn. And also, if you click on the move itself, it takes you to another page and it tells you which Pokemon can learn it and which Pokemon can learn it via breeding. So, egg moves are something you might want to consider because there are times where a Pokemon cannot learn that move any other way via level up or TM. Finally, the last thing you might want to consider is if a Pokemon has a hidden ability. Um, so, actually, I, I keep doing I always do this. So, if I go back to my PC. Um, I have over here, actually no, where is it? I have a Cursula, which I won, oh sorry, I caught from a raid. And if I go here, it has its hidden ability, Perish Body. So, that's its hidden ability, its normal ability is weak armor. Um, Pokemon that you breed can inherit 
the hidden ability. And I believe if it has the hidden ability, you've got a good chance of the Pokemon that you hatch having the hidden ability as well. Um, which in this case is Cursed Body on Corsola, but I believe I've thrown away all my Corsola that had weak armor. There is a chance that the Pokemon that you hatch doesn't have the hidden ability. So if you're specifically after a hidden ability and you finally hatch a Vive IV Pokemon, just make sure you have got the hidden ability on there. You can buy ability capsules, so if you do get a Pokemon that you don't want to have a hidden ability, you can swap off that. But I do not believe, even if you've hatched the Pokemon with this ability, using a bottle, uh, sorry, using an ability capsule can bring back the hidden ability, so think twice before doing that. Um, but yeah, so you can see here, Course Alert's uh, hidden ability is Cursed Body, as opposed to Weak Armor again. I think it's Weak Armor anyway. Um, so when this evolves, this will be a Perish Body Curse Alert. Um, whereas if it had weak armor, it would evolve into Kessler with weak armor. So it's just be careful when you're trying to breed for um, certain abilities. Like, for example, my Dreepy, people seem to think that Infiltrator is better, and I'd probably agree. But as you can see here, my other one has the clear body ability. And if I was to breed these, it's pretty much random. I think it will favor the male, um, but there is a chance that I could get the clear body from the female as well. So... I think that's pretty much it when it comes to breeding. Um, I hope this was educational in some way. I hope that um, it wasn't confusing. I think I've explained things as simple as I can, but I do also have a tendency to ramble. So if I have gone on and you don't understand some things, by all means, feel free to leave some comments in the uh, comment section below or come follow me on Twitter at DomFanatic. I'll also leave a link to that in the description. And if you want to message me on there, slide into my DMs, you know, do anything like that, then feel free to ask because I would like to encourage people to get into the competitive scene if possible. Um, because I think watching and playing VGC is fun. Competitive Pokemon sort of online, uh, online spot battles, whatever they're called this generation, are fun. And things like um, Draft League are fun as well. And it can encourage you to learn more things about Pokemon Showdown and stuff like that as well where I think most leagues are probably going to operate this season. But that's a slight tangent. Like I said, if you have any questions about breeding or anything like that, then just let me know. Um, what I'm also going to do is I'm going to plan on sort of opening up my own server on Discord. Not like a fan server or anything, but it's going to be like my area. I want it to be like a hub for trading, a hub for max raid battling with each other, um, and just maybe battling as well. Like once you've maybe bred a few competitive Pokemon yourself, you can go into a a 6v6 single battle or like a 4v4 double battle with your with an opponent you know just a good place to hang out and talk pokemon so if you guys did enjoy um i would really appreciate it if you left a like um or a subscription because i feel like this hopefully is gonna help a lot of you guys and i hope oh sorry i plan on releasing more videos in the future um sort of guide related properly next up might be max raid battles sort of like strategies you can consider what things uh, you can get from doing them, the items they drop, all sorts of things can be covered in Max Raid Battles. So, yeah, thank you for watching this guide, guys. If you found it useful, do let me know because I do actually appreciate the feedback more than anything else and, and discussions surrounding the video. Um, so thanks for watching, guys, and I'll see you next time. Bye.